discount rates. So why a discount rate? Under the current lease accounting standards, if you do not have any capital leases, or if we put it in another way, if you don't have any operating leases in your portfolio and you've yet to adopt, you don't currently have to contend with a present value calculation. Uh, so in, for those of you who have not, who are new to this and uh, you only have had operating leases or short-term leases in the past and not had to worry about discount rates and calculating the present value of a liability, uh, then you may be wondering what is the need for a discount rate? Essentially, when you do transition to ASC 42 or IFRS 16, if you've already transitioned or GASB 87 going forward, all of your leases are now going to be presented on the balance sheet or the majority of your leases. When we say majority, we may be excluding uh, some scoped out items like short-term leases or immaterial low value assets and so on and so forth. So uh, let's keep it at the majority. The majority of your leases will be presented on the balance sheet or the statement of uh, net position. From an IFRS 16 standpoint, uh, it is a slight, uh, a similar definition, but there are some slight nuances to it. Uh, it states that the rate of interest that a lessee would have to pay to borrow over a similar term and with a similar security, the funds necessary to obtain an asset of similar values to the right of use asset. So the difference here is we're obtaining an asset. What are, uh, we're looking at the funds necessary to obtain an asset of similar value. A lot of you who are under IFRS 16 uh, may be very familiar with this since IFRS 16 went into effect in uh, back in 2019 for all entities, both public and private. So along the same lines here, um, the implicit rate for IFRS 16, um, slightly different. Um, it is defined within the appendix um, and it, it's the rate of interest that would cause the present value of the lease payments and similarly the unguaranteed residual value to equal the fair value of the underlying asset and any initial direct cost of the lessor. So putting that into our formula here, um, you're going to see it's very similar to the one for ASC 842. Uh, the difference here being on the more obvious side that the related investment tax credits are not included in the IFRS 16 calculation and definition. Um, so you're not seeing that being taken out of the fair value here. Rather, it's just the total fair value of the asset um, that's being included. So that's one big difference um, for the implicit rate under IFRS 16. Now we want to take a look at an example here. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually utilize Excel um, using their internal rate of return or IRR function um, with some background information. So let's just assume for our example here, these are the, the facts. So we have a lease um, that the lessor is charging the lessee $4,000 annually, and this payment is made directly to the lessor at the beginning of each year. We're also going to make the assumption in this example um, that the lease is starting on 1-1 of 2020, and that is a five-year year lease term. Now, additionally, some other uh, factors here um, is that all of the lease commencement date, the fair value of the asset being leased is $15,000. Additionally, um, at the end of the lease term, um, the lessor has expected that the fair value of the asset they're going to receive back, or we can call this the unguaranteed or expected residual value, that they estimated to be $1,000 at the end of the lease term. Now, additionally, um, the lessor has incurred initial direct costs of $2,000. And I know we talked about some differences among the standards here. We're going to just use that $2,000 as our initial direct cost amount for all of the standards here when we are applying this into our example. So let's go ahead and get started here um, with our first step. If you were to do this in Excel yourself to try to calculate this IRR function, which is the implicit rate, first thing you are going to do is set up the schedule headers and periods associated with the lease. So we said this is a five-year lease, um, but the payments are occurring as of the beginning of each year. Meaning in this case, we're gonna have a period zero where there's gonna be some activity. And so there's gonna be payments in that period zero. And then we also have at the end this period five, there's not gonna be any lease payments occurring at that time, but you're gonna have um, a residual value or unguaranteed residual value that's being estimated at the end of the lease. So we've numbered our periods zero through five here and also added headers for those additional items or components that make up our schedule, um, the fair value here, the unguaranteed residual value, 
those initial direct costs by the lessor, and then those payments in advance. So these are all the cash flows that we're going to use um, to come up with the net cash flow. And from that, we're going to be able to calculate the implicit rate using that internal rate of return or IRR function within Excel. All right. So now all we need to do is start plugging in those different facts. So we mentioned that the fair value of the asset at the beginning of the lease is $15,000. So we're going to plug that $15,000 into a period zero because this is right at the start of the lease. And it's going to be a negative value here. Now, the reason that this is a negative value um, is because we're thinking about this as the lessor, right? So this is you know, a negative ca cash flow for them because they're essentially losing that value to the lessee. And so it's going to be a negative cash flow in that very first period. All right, next step here is we're going to input the residual value. And so this is the estimated value that the lessor is going to basically get back with this asset, that the asset is going to be worth as of the end of the lease. So in this case, it was $1,000. And you're seeing that this is getting input as of period five. So this is essentially as of the end of the lease. And so that $1,000 is coming back to the lessor with that value. So it's going to be a positive amount as a positive cash flow for the lessor. All right, now we have our input of initial direct costs here. And the initial direct costs are costs made by the lessor to you know, get into the lease that wouldn't have been incurred otherwise. So the initial direct costs are a cash outflow or a negative value here for the lessor. So they're gonna input that as a negative $2,000. And this occurred before the lease started. So it, in that period zero, again, this is the initial direct cost of the lessor to get the lease going. All right, our next step here is the actual payments themselves. Um, so we mentioned that this was a five year lease with $4,000 payments that are made in advance at the beginning of each year. And so those are positive cash flows for the lessor because they're going to be receiving those payments in advance. And they're starting in the period zero because that first payment and all the other payments are being made as of the beginning of the year or in advance. And so we don't have one happening at the end of the lease. So there's a zero in that period five, um, indicating that we have made those five payments in advance for all of the other years. All right. Next, what we're going to do um, is calculate the net cash flow. So we're going to use this to figure out the internal rate of return on all of these different inputs. And so what you would need to do is sum the values on the left column. So the fair value, initial drag cost, payments in advance come out to negative 13. And then we have the other items here, those other positive cash flows of 4,000 up until that period five, where you have a positive cash flow of 1,000. So we need to figure out what the net cash flow is for these values to come up with the internal rate of return based on the cash flows for the lessor. So how do we do that? Well, what you're gonna do in Excel um, is you're gonna sum the columns or the uh, tabs here uh, that have those net cash flows. So those cells um, are gonna be your net cash flow based on the other information. So you're gonna type equals IRR to use this internal rate of return function on those different cells, summing them together. And that's going to give us what our implicit interest rate is based on the terms of our lease. So what is that? Well, in this case, it happens to be 11%. Um, and so this 11.01% is the IRR and also the implicit rate um, based on the information in our lease. All right, so the very first box in that formula was to calculate the present value of our lease payment. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that implicit rate that we just figured out with the IRR function, the 11.01%, and we're gonna plug this into this present value calculation to see what we come up with. So up at the top on the right side, you see that there's a number of periods. That's our lease term, which is our five-year lease term. We're going to plug in our IRR of 11.01%. The periods that we're going to be using are in years. Uh, those payments were made annually, and they were made at the beginning of the period. And so, again, you're going to see that period zero here as well, since they're made in advance. 
And we're going to plug that $4,000 payment that's being made over that five year period into this sheet here. And it'll come up with a present value for us of these payments of $16,407. the left side that very first bubble in our formula the second is the present value of the expected or unguaranteed residual value now this is one value um, as of the end of the lease term this is the amount that the lessor expects the asset to be worth at the end of the lease so we're going to still have five periods here when we plug this into our tool and the 11.01 percent years are still going to be the periods but the parent here we're going to select that this is made at the end of the period because this is the value at the end of the lease, the very end. So those payments before were happening at the beginning of each period. This valuation is happening at the end of the lease. So we need to select payment made at the end of the period and plug in what the estimated increment or the estimated residual value was here, um, or the expected residual value, which was $1,000, and figure out the present value of that sum amount, which by plugging it into this tool, you can see that it is $593. All right, so now what we're gonna do, again, to further validate this information is to plug all of our numbers into our formula here. And so we're gonna start with that left-hand side. We just figured out that the present value of the lease payments using the 11.01% is $16,407. We also decided that the present value of the expected future value or the expected residual value of the asset that $1,000 present value is $593 using that same 11.01%. So that's what we needed to apply the implicit rate to. And now we just plug in the other values. Um, so our fair value, which was $15,000, and we didn't have any investment tax credit. And the initial direct cost here, which we're going to see were $2,000. So does the left side of the equation equal the right side of the equation? Yes. $17,000 does in fact equal $17,000, which means that we have fully validated our implicit rate here of 11.01, .01, which we found by using the internal rate of return function within Excel. All right, so I want to pause here for a moment and step back because what we were just doing um, was if you were to manually calculate your implicit rate. Um, again, as the lessor, you may have that those inputs or you should have those inputs in order to calculate yourself. The lessee will not most of the time have that information readily available. But if that looked like a lot to you, I mean, it was, you know, 10 or so slides and a lot of different steps and it can get a little complicated. I would like to recommend um, one of our free tools that is going to be coming out soon called the implicit or least rate, rate implicit tool. And so what this will actually allow you to do um, is to plug in those different inputs that are required in those formulas. So you'll first, you'll name the lease, you'll plug in the dates or the term of the lease, that fair value, your payment information, the residual value, and it will actually give you the results and calculate the implicit rate for you without having to go through that process of figuring out the IRR using that Excel you know, template and then validating that information with the present value calculator. We're going to go ahead and jump into our very last topic today, um, which is really getting around best practices in terms of the application of these rates or how you should approach this topic. <clears throat> so what essentially the first question I make come into play is why the implicit rate may not be readily determinable. There is one of two scenarios. The first one is you may be dealing with specialized assets, like maybe airport terminals or certain types of real estate and so on and so forth. And you may not be able to determine the market terms of those assets and require the help of some consultants. So th that may be one area where it may be difficult. The other area may be the inter uh, from internal metric from the standpoint of the lessor or the lessee. Uh, you may require uh, judgment uh, uh, as a lessor as to how you would apply this rate. But at the end of the day, you know, as we've highlighted, the implicit rate would be a requirement of the lessor to determine. But from the lessee standpoint, uh, that information is rarely disclosed. If you were to approach your lessor today, they probably wouldn't be as privy to share that information with you as you would imagine. Um, and there may be some other uh, variable factors going into it, as Rachel has outlined in term when we calculated that example there. If that was a little strenuous on in terms of the calculations we saw today, then 
that from that standpoint, especially if you have a sizable portfolio, the implicit rate may not be the route that you want to go down. And in reality, as we've mentioned, a lot of our clients, the vast majority of our clients go down the route of using an incremental borrowing rate instead of an implicit rate. The next uh, area we want, really want to briefly summarize is the application of it. Well, now that you've determined what rate you want to use, let's say you're not using the implicit rate, how would you apply your incremental borrowing rate to your portfolio of leases? Well, there are two options, two commonly held approaches. You can do it lease by lease, or you can do it as a portfolio approach. And the portfolio approach is more in the lines of a practical expedient, whereby, you know, if you have a large number of leases, it may be more beneficial or prudent for you to say, assess, you know what, based on the, lo the, the location of our assets, where they reside, their jurisdiction, we're gonna assign rates on that, where they uh, fall in the entity, or based maybe on lease classification. One thing we do want to note is specifically to GASB 87, there is no mention of using a portfolio rate, but a lot of our clients have taken the additional step of conferring with their auditors or consultants to assess if that would be a, a, a prudent approach to take, uh, since it does make life a lot easier. Uh, so, in the application of uh, uh, using a discount rate at a portfolio level, versus a lease by lease basis, there are some obvious pros and cons that can be weighed up against each other. First off, from the lessee standpoint, um, if uh, from the lease by lease standpoint, excuse me, the, the obvious pros are going to be get an accurate representation of the rate and thus the liability. You, you're using a rate that's specific to the asset that you've assessed, and therefore you can set, uh, have a more accurate representation of your liability and therefore the corresponding asset. From the portfolio approach, uh, the obvious benefits are that it's a short-lived process. It's not going to be time intensive. It's also going to be a cost saver. Let's say you have 100 leases and now you're not trying to determine a rate for each lease or trying to get a consultant involved. Rather, uh, you're just using a overall incremental borrowing rate across your portfolio based on the remaining term of that asset. And then lastly, uh, you, can, you can bucket these rates. Do you want to do it specific to different types of assets um, or do you want to do it in similarities in terms of segmenting of the organization, you know, maybe by cost center or department, whatever rates, uh, however you want to assign those rates, you do have flexibility in grouping those rates by asset, by classification, by any type of other uh, uh, determination where they share, share similarities. Now, there are some downsides to either approach. From the lease by lease standpoint, it is tedious. It's time consuming. Rachel walked us through a process today of calculating an implicit rate. Even if you're not calculating the implicit rate, but you're using the incremental borrowing rate, it could still be a time consuming process to assess what an appropriate incremental borrowing rate would be for each asset. Um, and it's, it's pretty costly. Well, when you put time and cost together, then you may want to lean towards a portfolio rate. And of course, we're also taking into account the size of your portfolio. If you have 20 or so leases, uh, you may get a you may say you know what we do have the time we do have the resources to do it lease by lease or if you're looking at the materiality of your assets the portfolio approach however uh, the, the downsides of it is it's an inexact rate we're using an estimate at the end of the day so it's not going to give us the the, the most in, uh, accurate representation of our liability and asset and because it's an inexact rate, we're going to have to document our assessment, of how we arrived at that incremental borrowing rate and how it's applied across our portfolio of leases. So a little bit more documentation on that part. But at the end of the day, um, this, it, these are some of the flexibilities that are provided to you by the guidance. Um, if you're under ASCA 42 or IFRS 16, I would take advantage of the portfolio approach as the majority of our clients have taken that route especially depending on the portfolio size, 